Hey all you beautiful people, welcome to Daz Talks Footy, as always I am Daz, if you haven't subscribed yet please do so, you get to be a part of the best footy community on YouTube, so click that subscribe button, you don't have to exit the video, and if you're thinking to yourself, Dazzling, where is my round review, I've got some good news and bad news on that part, the bad news is, is that the full scale round reviews are not going to be something that I'm going to be able to sustain long term, and I don't want to be able to do it once every two weeks, <laughs> or anything like that. I'm using a lot of my Mondays because life is getting a little bit busier at the moment and my time priorities need to go elsewhere as well, is I'm spending a lot of my Mondays recording a lot of videos that don't need a whole lot of editing and post recording work. Um, so I'm going to be recording about the things that I really, really, really want to talk about and get out there. So you're actually probably going to get more uploads during the week, but it's less work for me to get the videos out. So Things like the Brownlow Predictor, the Power Rankings, they're still going to be there. The Power Rankings is going to be their own independent video. The Brownlow Predictor is actually going to be in the tips video. So we'll go through the Brownlow leaderboard from last week and go into next week. So look out for that as well. And there's probably going to be more uploads during the week. But in this video, as you can probably tell by the title, are the 0-2 teams in trouble? And what I mean by that is, are these teams victims of a poor fixture? Are they in deep trouble? Are they injury affected? How do I think the 0-2 teams are going to go for the rest of 2022? It's as simple as that, and then I'll let you guys go. Let's get into it. So all of the 0-2 teams, as you can see, are there. Now, I want to eliminate West Coast and Adelaide from the conversation because Adelaide are a rebuilding team, and their ability to draft early draft talent has been an abomination. So I do feel for Matty Nix there. And the Eagles, round one, uh, they lost a game that they probably could have won, but they put up a hell of a fight given the COVID outs, the injury outs, and all those kinds of things. They put up a great fight against North as well, although their senior players did cost them late, but if there is a team that can rely on reasons and excuses as to why they are 0-2, it is them. So West Coast are eliminated from this conversation, and I want to start with Port Adelaide, who put up a great fight against Brisbane up at the Gabba and fell apart defensively, but I don't think their midfield was as good in round one as what they got credit for. Brisbane looked a bit off in the opening two and a half quarters, and then wrestled the momentum back and didn't let it go for the rest of the game. And then against Hawthorne, Port Adelaide were genuinely smacked, and they were smacked on transition. They won the clearances, the contested ball was pretty even, and they had a lot more inside 50s. But what they did against Brisbane and what they did against Hawthorne is one of their two fatal flaws. That first fatal flaw is kicking the ball onto their forwards' heads. They're not Charlie Dixon. Now, Charlie not being there is a problem, but considering they are now negative 75 in point differential, Charlie Dixon is not worth 12 and a half goals in two games I don't care how good he is. The man hasn't kicked 50 goals in one year. He is not worth 75 points. Now, Mitch Georgiades is a good player and a guy who I can see as a Jack Gunston 2.0. Not a great overhead mark, but a guy that can use his body really, really well. And prior to the start of this year, was a really good set shot kick for goal. And he's not now, which is weird. But I do see a good future with him. I'm not a Jeremy Finlayson fan personally when it comes to on the footy field. What sucks about that is like if a guy is a knob and you're not a massive fan of him on the field, it becomes probably a bit easier. But given that I have no reason to believe that Jeremy is any sort of a flog, I, I it's hard for me to say that I'm not a great fan. But I don't understand the Port Adelaide pickup. I don't really understand what he adds there. And he hasn't had a good start to the year. And why do Port fans and the commentators still think Todd Marshall is going to be an A-grader? I, I don't think he's shown much to be an A-grader yet. But those three in the forward line are not working together. And the delivery inside 50 for a team that was a preliminary finalist in the last two years has been crap. It's as simple as that. It has been garbage. Now, Alir Alir is out for a while. And I thought Sam Skinner was okay, although with ball in hand, he does scare me. Hawthorne did go through that with a 3 P with a James Frawley type, for example. So, Port Adelaide fans, don't jump off him too hard. You had some real non-performers on the weekend that weren't him. So, relax. But where do Port go from here? I still think Port are an okay team. But me having them as number two in the power rankings in the preseason is something that after two games, I'm going to say I was completely wrong about. Ken Hinckley's inability to cope in-game 
with momentum swings is just not good enough. He's stopping them from winning a flag. It's as simple as that. So I don't think Port Adelaide can win the flag. They are probably going to feature in the power rankings video, even though they are 0-2, because I've got faith in the list. I don't have a lot of faith in the coach, and they really need to improve their delivery all over the ground, because their ball use at times can be absolutely horrific. So Port, I think, are just going to be okay. I don't see them as a top four team in 2022 which coming into the preseason is probably a failure, but it's not a great start. There is a positive for Ken Hinckley. There is one coach that's worse when it comes to dealing with momentum swings, and that's Leon Cameron. So the Giants, they're going to play catch-up again. They might finish seventh, and they'll probably win a final or lose a close one, and they'll still be nowhere. So what the hell? Their midfield on paper, you add Tom Green into a mix of Stephen Cornelio, Josh Kelly, Callan Ward... They're all kind of the same. Now, I'm take Josh Kelly out of the equation, but you look at Callum Ward, Tim Torano, Stephen Cornelio, Tom Green. All hard nuts, all contested ball winners, all pretty good with their hands, not great with their feet. Josh Kelly is the only one in that midfield I trust kicking inside 50. That's a huge problem. I, I like their defense. Sam Taylor's a star. I like it. Connor Iden and Isaac Cumming are developing players that are only going to get better and better and better across their careers, but their forward line is bad. Jesse Hogan, Jake Riccardi, and Harry Himmelberg cannot put pressure on at all. I know they're missing Toby Green, and he does make them a better player, but Toby isn't exactly a forward 50 pressure player. They really need someone. I'm hoping it's a Tanner Bruin type, but they need someone, and I'm putting it on Bobby Hill here, that needs to become, I don't want to say Cyril-like, but the great teams, Richmond, Hawthorne, even Geelong, with guys like Stokes and these guys, put pressure on and it was made hard to get the ball outside their 50. For the Giants, Jaden Short and Nathan Broad walked it out. It was a joke. The Giants, they need to get better. And Port and GWS, I put it on the Facebook page. If you haven't joined that already, please do so. Leon Cameron and Ken Inkley are basically giving Clarko the keys right now because if I was running Port and GWS, if this game plan continues, no matter how many wins they have, they're not winning a flag. It's as simple as that. And the last of the contenders is the Bulldogs now. Coming into the year, I was apprehensive about the Dogs because their forward line without Josh Bruce isn't great, and that has proven to be a disaster. And their back line is shot. Alex Keith, I've got a lot of time for Alex Keith as a player, but he's a number two defender. And playing like an, uh, playing as a number one, which isn't great, but their next best key defender plays like a number four. And it's gross and it's not good. Bailey Williams can win one-on-one. -on -one, so can Taylor DeRay. But maybe they both need to play in the team. And they need to do a bit of a reshuffling. Because I just don't see how the dogs are going to stop the opposition from scoring. They've got the Swans on the weekend. They're probably going to be 0-3. And, and it's not good. But the dogs midfield, we always got told. The dogs midfield is going to make it okay. Is it? Because this is now three games in a row, Carlton, Melbourne, and Melbourne in the grand final, where they just let the back of the stoppage, or the front of the stoppage for the team that's got the ball, completely wide open, and able to let, in the last three weeks, Petrarca in the grand final, Petrarca again, and Sam Walsh and Matt Kennedy combination to walk out the front of that stoppage and give their forwards a chance. And Ben Brown and Bailey Fritch in the grand final, Ben Brown, Bailey Fritch in round one, and Harry McKay and Charlie Kerno did it extraordinarily well on the weekend. And up against Sydney, Buddy, Hayden McLean, and Logan McDonald are going to take advantage of that. The dogs aren't winning the flag. It's as simple as that. They're really not. Lee Montagna, Joey, the uh, Italian wombat, as he's called, or the Greek wombat on Triple M, came out with every team in the 21st century that has lost by more than 50 points didn't win a final in the 21st century, the next year. The Dogs right now aren't even playing like a top eight team. Will they be okay? I'm not 100% sure. But if I was a Dogs fan, I would be not happy about the fact that rock up Thursday night, you're either going to be 1-2 and two with a scrappy win, or you're going to be 0-3 and, and struggling to make the eight. 
And last but not least, the Bombers. Now, Harrison Jones, Anthony McDonald, Tip and Woody being injured really doesn't help them. And their first quarter against Brisbane was very good. But given the fact that we've now seen four quarters against Geelong that were deplorable, a back half of a Brisbane game, they've had Patrick Dangerfield and Lockie Neal destroy them in round one. And it doesn't look like that's going to change. Zach Merritt out with a syndesmosis injury isn't helpful in the slightest. Their midfield didn't look good at all and they haven't really looked good no Kyle Langford as well who is a bigger loss than I think he's been given credit for so yeah Essendon have been hit by the injury bug all teams have but they don't have the depth to go with it really like Jai Caldwell but Dylan Shiel as the replacement for Merritt is just nowhere near the same and when you've got James Stewart putting up the efforts that he put up against Brisbane in letting that ball go through for a goal regardless if he thinks it was touched you take the extra step and punch that over the line it's as simple as that. No excuses. You think Dennis Pagan or Mick Malthouse in the 90s would have put up with that rubbish? John Kennedy Sr. in the 70s? God, no. Nor should it be now in a social media sense. Yes, mental health is important, but at the end of the day, we cannot put kit gloves on when things are meant to be made. I've worked for 50 grand a year in which if you didn't know how to dice an onion, you would be kicked out of every kitchen. If you're a fullback and you don't know to punch that ball over... You're in big, big trouble. But that was symbolic of the way that Essendon have allowed their midfield to be lazily beaten and their forwards not really putting a lot of pressure on. Although Essendon do have an unhealthy squad at the moment, the effort has been less than what I think Bombers fans wanted it to. Can I see the Bombers making the eight? I, I can, but post buy, they're going to need a lot of things go their way and they are going to need to be 100% healthy. So that's it, guys. What do you think about all the 0-2 teams? Do you think any of them are going to make the 8? Do you think any of them are going to make the top 4? And do you think any of them are going to win a final? I can't wait to get more videos out to you this week. I hope you understand about the reviews like I talked about at the start. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. Can't wait to hear from you. Got plenty of stuff coming this week, including the tips video. Went 5 for 9 this week and 2 for 3 in on the line. So hopefully you got on individually and you pulled a profit there. I'll see you in the next video, guys. Take it easy. How good was that win by the Hawks, by the way? Goodbye.